Okay, so that uh, is a good uh, segue into my talk. I wanted to focus on constraining the engine paradigms by using, and ultimately what I have is, want to give this kind of a, a method um, which needs more data, this kind of thing. So the, the, the PPM, uh, uh, PPM has been very influential in at least our thinking about what can possibly power these um, the bipolar outflows. In particular, this Bjarne one paper is keeps me awake at night uh, because the uh, momentum that were found to power these population of 28 or so ppn uh, exceed the, the radiation available by several orders of magnitude. Uh, and these, but these are more demanding uh, from a mechanical luminosity and from a momentum point of view than, than any of the pn. So if the pn, the pn are extensions of the ppn, you know, if it's just, for example, accretion and it's just the time evolution of accretion, then understanding the extreme objects, to some extent, is uh, you know, becomes even more important. And so, one question is, what fraction of PPN does this characterize? Um, and the, and so these, and, and I want to explore the possibility that accretion uh, is behind these. And but having said that, uh, what what kind of accretion? What are the limits that you can put on the accretion? And in particular, the Rates. So there are some constraints on the, you know, the engine would be constrained by the energy that you put into the system or the mass that's ejected from it. And there's actually a paper by Huggins which has power in the title, Constraints on Engine, on, on using power to constrain, measure power to train the incumbent. Actually in the paper there's no power constraints, it's all uh, uh, energy and mass. And I mentioned it to him and it's sort of an amusement, but I think it's an important thing because I hear I want to focus on constraining actually the power. So, um, um, just be, and before that, a few points on magnetic fields. And I'll be this way, I didn't want to say much about this, but magnetic fields are really a consequence, not the you know, magnetic fields <coughs> drive are, um, they're the drive belt, they're not the motor. Uh, and they are derived from, from, from the kinetic energy uh, in binary interaction. So that supplies the free energy in the differential rotation of turbulence, and that amplifies the field. So that really to think of them as a dry belt and not the motor, the, the engine is really in the set of paradigms that involve accretion is really gravitation and, and, and the accretion. So we think of limiting this, this, this set of models to accretion, it's, it's the gravitation and power. Uh, now, uh, having said that, just one other point about the, you know, uh, about the magnetic mediation. So, uh, the, there are two classes of magnetic models, actually. This is, one is the magnetic tower that we've heard described, and, that, and, and the other is the magnetocentrifugal launch, and they're actually different in the sense that the magnetic tower is a wound up magnetic field that's amplified at the base. The foot points are both located at, at the base. Uh, the magnetic cavity rises up and the, the, the flow is basically magnetically dominated over very large distances, at least that's the idea. In the magnetocentrifugal launch, the flow, oops, the, uh, the, the, the flow is actually being launched from the disk itself. Here you're pushing flow above, here you're, here you're launching flow from the disk itself. And after a, a, a very short distance, maybe 50 times the launch radius, this becomes flow dominated. So if you wanted to distinguish these observationally, what you could look at is the polarization of the field orientation. These, so this is just showing the polaroidal field, but there's also a toroidal field. And what you would see looking at the axis to the edge for the magnetic tower is strong magnetic field at the pole and bending over to the edge, uh, becoming toroidal at the edge. To, if you look at the magnetocentrifugal launch at large distances, the flow is dominated, dominant. So if there were a flow profile in the outflow, if the jet didn't have a uniform velocity across the jet, any shear would be able to stretch the magnetic field, and you'd expect that the field would have more polarization along the jet, more or less everywhere, or less overall polarization. So that doesn't mean that it's not magnetically launched in both cases, but the actual observation could be distinct that that's one point to be mind. Now, 
no matter what's driving the thing, all just obey some basic relations, and this is very important. The mechanical luminosity of the jet is less than the accretion luminosity, so the amount of energy that you accrete per unit time multiplied by the Keplerian speed of the inner orbit, roughly the, the, is the amount of energy that you have available to do work or radiate. So the mechanical luminosity is less than that. And all jet models basically predict that the outflow speed is some number of order unity times the Keplerian speed of the innermost radius. So the inequality <coughs> here implies that the accretion rate is greater than the, the needed accretion rate is at least as large as whatever chi this is, let's say it's three uh, squared, which is then makes this uh, ten times the jet outflow rate. So this is this is an inequality. Now to constrain the accretion rate, you can use momentum conservation. And momentum conservation uh, are, comes from what you measure. So basically, the, to constrain, so the accretion rate in any system has to be larger than, so you measure the observed jet, basically the jet, what you measure in the jet has the mass of the jet and its velocity, but the jet was launched at some larger velocity with lower mass. So as it plows through the ambient medium, it collects mass. If you, as long as you have Q, as long as you have this uh, chi, this parameter chi, you can trace back what the outflow speed was from theory and, and, and use the momentum conservation to get a, a constraint on the needed accretion rate to supply that outflow mass rate. And you measure the quantities that measure the mass of the jet observed, you measure the velocity of the jet, and you measure the time scale over which the, the jet was accelerated or is operating. And then the chi and the Keplerian speed come from theory. Particularly, the Keplerian speed is whatever mass is the source of your accretion. So if it's a white dwarf, uh, if, it, if, if you have one, you have the 70 times larger inner speed than if you have a, a main sequence star. So for, for these objects, typically the PPN require the mass accretion rates are something like of this order, given these sort of scaling relations. Now, so so therefore, if you assume a particular type of accretor. Now you can consider uh, various modes of accretion and then, and then see how the observations fit onto that. Uh, yeah. Which modes of accretion have a high enough accretion rate? Well, the, the, the accretion onto the core that Jason talked about and we have earlier papers on and such, um, all those work actually. The estimates for the accretion onto the white dwarf core from a shredded companion, those all have enough accretion rate. I wasn't going to focus so much on those. One thing I would say in that context is that you, that, that you can have mechanisms that, that produce a jet <clears throat> that don't unbind the envelope in those circumstances. So if a planet falls onto the core from the accretion, it can power a jet, it might not unbind the envelope, but it might show as a jet. So that's relevant for, uh, for the, the post ATB. To unbind the object, you would you need probably a, 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 a low mass star, it would spiral in common envelope. But about the secondary, so let's constrain the, what model secondaries are possible. So if you consider, so here you get three example models of accretion, and what I'm going to do is put these values onto a plot of the, of the observationally constrained accretion rates that I derived from the uh, basic inequality that I showed before. So here's three example accretion rates. Bondi Royal, this is wind accretion, and I, I used the value that Mark Martin found, not found um, and here's the wind growth flow overflow, the, the, the value here is taken for a mirror, uh, and of course these depend on the companion distance and the companion uh, constituents, but you see how this sort of works, and then, then common envelope, so a simulation of common envelope evolution, uh, companion spiraling in and accreting as it's spiraling in, uh, that's the highest accretion rate of all of these three models, and this would be you know, the, sort of the highest that you might expect. So these are representative of three different paradigms of accretion. Wind roach low overflow again when the companion is inside the radius at which the, the, the is outside the the uh, uh, the roche low radius, but inside where the uh, wind hasn't yet been accelerated to escape speed, so it can flow. The wind itself can flow onto the companion. It's roche low. So here's the. Uh, Diagram, and uh, and this is you think of this as more of a, a method at the present time, because the data is what it is limited. Um, so I have two. So this is a white dwarf, uh, and by the way, this was done. This particular thing is in a thing in a paper in progress. The, the 
these were constructed by an uh, undergraduate, Scott Lucchini. White dwarf main sequence star, these are, because of the Keplerian speed, the uh, mechanical power, okay. mechanical power is less constrained, uh, it is, is less stringent because you get a higher outflow speed for a white dwarf, the inner Keplerian speed is higher, so the amount of the same, the same momentum, you need less secretion. So here, this is all of the objects taken from the Mirabal sample, uh, plotted as a function of chi. Remember, chi is the factor multiple times the escape speed at which the jet is accelerated. So uh, a factor of one or times the Keplerian speed. So typically, the, the blue regime is where the theory lies. So this is the theoretical sort of regime of jet models that produce chi's in this range. And here's the accretion rate uh, that these objects would require. So I, I have these demanded accretion rates that these objects would require from this sample as a function of the this chi, which is this parameter. Now, on the right, I have lines to indicate each of the different mechanisms of accretion uh, plotted uh, at, at the characteristic value. And so any viable accretion model has to have its line, you know, the, 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 the model is only viable for explaining a given object if the line for that model lies above the uh, observational line, the diagonal lines of the observational the inferred values required, assuming this particular value of chi. And these uh, are, the, uh, are the theoretical models for different <coughs> modes of accretion. In principle, ultimately, one would like to make a third dimension here, which is the separation of the binaries, if you knew that there were, you know, what the parameters of those binaries are. But you can see that, that for white, you know, so that you can see that there's a big difference between what's kind of ruled out main sequence and white work. So, in particular, let's look at the main sequence, which, is, which, is, which has a more uh, demanding requirements. Uh, the um, the in, in the yeah so so the, the Bondi accretion rate the typical Bondi from wind accretion is this line here at 20 AU. If you get you know if you if you get inside of this you're talking about a different mode of accretion. So anything that is is above this line, which is basically all of these objects, cannot be explained by standard companions to Bondi boil uh, wind accretion. You need another mechanism, either wind or slow uh, uh, something else. Now, I put this here, the red rectangle is this line of constraint just by the mechanical luminosity, but by observed luminosity in a very nice paper uh, in which the luminosity uh, influences the uh, line and alpha, so this is an observation constraint on the actual luminosity coming from the disk, not just the mechanical luminosity. It puts the red rectangle accretor here, and this object is is thought here to be Rochelot overflow, which is also a much higher accretion rate than Bondi well. So, but this diagram already, what we have from this is that wind accretion, uh, standard Bondi well wind accretion, cannot explain the high population of the, uh, the high momentum population of the PPM, and you know, the extent, whatever fraction that is, is what it is. So I'll just then skip to the conclusions um, here. Uh, and uh, so constraining the accretion rates from, from both theory and observations is, is a very important pinning on the engine paradigm. I mean, the, the most fundamental demand that you can ask is whether there's enough throughput of energy through the system uh, to give you the power for unit time, to give you the power that you see in the, in the observed outflows. Uh, in all jet models that are powered by accretion, you basically draw their energy from gravity. So you know, if you think of the energy flow, it's gravity, kinetic energy in the disk, then magnetic, then kinetic. Uh, and the PPM are more demanding. It is likely, because of these different modes of accretion that happen at different separation, I mean, likely different classes of engine, not a single, single scenario. Um, and the, the, the one thing we have learned from a limited sample, I think, already is that standard DHL cannot explain the high-powered wind. So if you don't, even if you don't see binaries, in those sources, the mode of accretion is not going to be BHL. But more data is ultimately needed you know, to make this chart, really a three-dimensional chart, have a third dimension in separation. 
and really carve out areas that you can imagine pin putting different all more and more data on the object and you'll carve out regions which are allowed and regions which are not allowed. So I just think that the power is something that we can get at you know, without a lot. It's just a kinematic constraint here from from the animation. So One question before we released. So. Uh, in the Ag Nebula, I remember just making aware of this fact that there is uh, this, the nice rings that imply a companion at a, a hundred a year or so, maybe even two hundred, uh, just looking at the spacing of the ring. But of course, we see also this weird uh, sort of narrow X shaped X shaped jet. And if uh, that jet were launched by one of these mechanisms, um, well, first of all, the 200 AV companion would be uh, not, would not agree sufficiently probably to launch that jet. Um, so, but would you assume there is a second star? It doesn't seem like with yeah, the stable well, system. So, I mean, I would say, I guess, two things about that. In the, the PNE phase, the PNE phase is not very demanded. PNE phase is it's not. It's a PPN. Yeah, a PPN, yeah. But well, we just say the, P the PN phase in general is not but in the, P in the PPN. It, that there's no way that that could supply the accretion to, to power the PPN. So it's way too far. That would be bonding accretion. There's no way. So it could be. I mean, the absence of a binary companion present doesn't necessarily mean you know it would have to be something that's inside. You know, it could be in the um, it could be in the four. In which case, you know, you wouldn't see it as a binary, but it could be. Could have been a shredded companion that's already inside of the core, shredded, producing an outflow that's you know you wouldn't see the companion. So not necessarily seeing the companion doesn't mean that there isn't the influence of a of a, of a different companion than the one you see. So we'll uh, while you're this evening while you're eating your shredded companion, I mean while while you're eating your your dinner, you can uh, think of other uh, questions for the speakers or tomorrow's speakers, and we'll take the session at the end of the night.